Hello. Hello, Hello Dr. Andrew. It's a pleasure to meet you. How are you doing? Nice to meet you too. I'm fine. My name is Ali. I am the product manager for something called Rise Up Academy at Rise Up, and I'm also the head of content. It's a pleasure to finally meet you and to interview you. Fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it. I am just going to join Zoom to the live feed on Facebook, and then we'll be good to go. Okay, great. I like the painting that you have in the background. <laughs> Thank you. More live on Facebook. So it looks like we are good to go. So hello everyone. My name is Ali, as I said. I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Nerlinger. Please correct me if I pronounce that. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, Dr. Andrew has earned a doctorate of medicine uh, from the University of Yale, and he also has a bachelor's in philosophy and uh, mathematics from the University of Notre Dame. He is a physician, VC, social impact innovator. Uh, he is a, also a venture partner at Billwood Ventures. Uh, those of you who are attended our 2019 summit, uh, had an opportunity to meet Bill. Uh, last and but not least, he co-created the adequately named Pandemic Tech <laughs> uh, Virtual Technology Incubator. And I read a lot about it, but I'd like to hear from you about the work you've been doing there. Of course, of course. Thank you very much for the invitation to do this. I know um, I actually was very disappointed to not be able to join. Um, and are you hearing me okay, just to make sure? Yeah, perfect. Okay, very good. I was disappointed that I couldn't join the Rise Up Summit um, alongside Bill, but I had uh, uh, two or three weeks earlier had had a, uh, our first baby girl at home. So, uh, so I Congratulations. was stuck in Austin. So thank you very much. So it was a, it was a shame to, um, to not be able to join, but it's, it's been a pleasure to have visited Egypt twice within the last year and a half. Uh, for one of our projects. And so when um, Rise Up got in touch with us, I think it's a fantastic organization. Um, and I think it's uh, what your goals are really uh, very critical right now, especially, um, you know, with some of the economic situations going on. So I appreciate the invitation to do this um, and look forward to connecting further with you and also with um, some of the participants as well to see if there's a way we could work together or see, um, you know, see if there's a way that we can help uh, with this um, you know, very exciting uh, Egyptian ecosystem. So thank you for that. Um, I'll give a brief overview, um, but of course, if anyone has any further questions, you know, please do ask them in the Q&A or the, the chat. Um, uh, just briefly, uh, my background is as an emergency medicine physician. Um, I practiced in Los Angeles um, for several years, but had a, um, a, a very big interest in technology development, health tech development. Um, alongside my wife, I started a consulting company in 2010 when we decided to leave clinical practice. And we started to work um, with uh, investors, family offices, and nonprofits profits, helping them to develop novel strategies in the innovation space. Um, our interests diverged a little bit. My wife started to work with uh, healthcare technology startups directly, um, and she currently is the director of healthcare at Austin Technology Incubator, which is okay. the incubator of the University of Texas at Austin. And then I started working more in the venture capital investing side of things, um, first with a firm called Vesalius Ventures uh, in Houston 
Vesalius was started by Dr. Bernard Harris, um, who is a NASA astronaut, um, also a physician, and also a venture capitalist. So a, a very wonderful person to, to work for and learn from. Um, but most relevantly to this conversation, he was one of the early pioneers in telemedicine. And Vesalius Ventures was focused on early stage telemedicine investment um, and uh, really has done quite a bit of work internationally as well. Um, two years ago, I started working, um, uh, we came to Austin, my wife and I, I started working with a new firm called Bill Wood Ventures. Um, Bill Wood Ventures is a family office of the aptly named Bill Wood, uh, who joined the Rise Up Summit. <clears throat> Bill's well known here in Texas. Um, he started uh, two of the most um, well-known venture firms in the, in the United States, probably. Um, the first being Austin Ventures, um, which, which really started the Austin technology scene um, 25, 30 years ago alongside the University of Texas and a couple other major, uh, major initiatives uh, that were here around the semiconductor space. Um, and then uh, he also started a firm currently known as Silverton Partners, which is currently the most active investor in Austin um, in the early stage space. So um, Bill, uh, several years ago, started his own family office to continue acting and investing like a venture firm um, in early stage investments. And so I've been working with him for the last couple of years as he's, uh, as he's built out his family office. Um, in 2016, uh, my wife and I, um, we had been very interested in infectious disease outbreaks. I'd done some research in microbiology and in disaster relief medicine and thought that this was an area that was being critically under addressed. Um, we noticed that mostly people assumed that the risk of infectious disease outbreak was um, the responsibility of governments and was the responsibility of nonprofits to handle. And while they do a great job doing that, we thought there was a really significant disconnect with the technology community. Um, we noticed that most acutely when we would travel internationally. Um, and really the idea for this project came from a visit to Ethiopia. We were attending a conference at the African Union and got to meet um, some local African innovators who, who had really fantastic ideas that were locally driven ideas to solve problems in their own local communities. Okay. But given the lack of established innovation ecosystems, it was very difficult to get these innovations to progress them, whether it was from funding or engineering or needing business expertise or expertise in scaling. Um, you know, there were, there were so many things that were missing. And so we started Pandemic Tech as an effort to bridge that gap between the technology community and what now is being called the global health security community. Um, and now this is a, a very small group that is now very much in the news and all of the, you know, all the people that you see on the, on the news reports there, it's, it's fun to have met them over the last couple of years within this small community. So the purpose of Pandemic Tech was really to bring resources and networks to bear. It's a very narrowly focused virtual incubator. Um, and so we work with early stage innovators from around the world on helping to implement their projects that incorporate innovation solving global health security problems. Now, our, um, our approach had been to focus on raising awareness of of the importance of this issue, um, but that's changed very dramatically over the last couple months. Um, okay. We no longer need to raise awareness of the issue. I think people get it, especially um, you know here in the United States. Our you know government just passed a two trillion U.S. dollar um, economic package, um, uh, and so so we look and, and look back a little bit and think, you know, that's it's amazing what an impact that was. And, and now I think there won't be a lot of trouble um, uh, talking about the importance of this issue. Um, and so, so what we've really been focused on doing is continuing to identify these very promising innovators um, uh, from around the world who we can bring in to build our network. You know, we're creating our own virtual ecosystem. Um, in order to accelerate that process, um, we had had it in the works for several months, but announced it um, in February, our new um, Pandemic Tech Innovation Fellowship 2020. Um, which uh, is, and maybe you can share a link or I can share a link in the Q&A shortly, um, but it's our $100,000 um, Global Health Security Innovation Challenge. Um, and we're using that as a platform to kind of help continue to grow our community. Um, and, and so this is what we're doing. I'll, I'll mention briefly two of our projects, given the relevance to, um, you know, rise up. Um, one of them is we're very involved with the World Health Organization. We work closely with the Africa Regional Office. Um, we've also done some advising to the Health Emergencies Program around how the private sector um, can, can get more involved 
in innovation programs and in global health security. And so, for example, we were, we were very happy to have um, uh, to participated and judged uh, WHO Afro, um, which of course Egypt is not part of the Africa yes. region, um, uh, but uh, it, yeah, they do kind of, there's a significant overlap. We were very excited to judge the hackathon that they focused on with uh, coronavirus um, solutions. And so things like that, I think are really important to raise awareness in local innovation communities about how important that is. I think it would be great to see something like that happen in Egypt. Um, and then the second thing, for actually several years, we've been, um, we've been working together with a couple partners in Cairo and in Mexico, actually, wow. um, to, for a biosafety focused and biosafety and biosecurity focused training program. And it was, this is, this is what brought us to Cairo the last um, two times where we got to, you know, really get exposed to Egypt's ecosystem. Um, what we were doing is uh, we helped to sponsor and then further organize a partnership that had grown between Cairo University and Mexico's Ministry of Health. Um, where um, there's a uh, one of our partners, one of our senior advisors is named Luis Ochoa Carrera. He's one of the world's experts in biosafety training. And so we brought him to Egypt and he's put on several training seminars um, with Cairo University, um, in different parts of Cairo University. And so that's been a, that's been a real, um, a really incredible experience. And we were, we were due to be over there in April. Uh, unfortunately, that's, we've had to postpone that. And we're, we're, tr we're talking about making it virtual. Um, but uh, the final thing I'll say before moving on is uh, while we were over there, we had the, the incredible opportunity to get acquainted with some of the folks who were prominent in the ecosystem in Egypt. Um, we got to visit the Greek campus. Um, we got to meet people from AUC and got to see really what a promising and exciting entrepreneurship ecosystem Egypt is building. Um, and, and I think it it's really has the opportunity to stand as a, as a benchmark um, in Africa as a whole. And so that's what my excitement from from meeting you at Rise Up and, and doing whatever we can to help the growth of the ecosystem in Egypt is really focused on the enormous potential uh, that you have to be kind of leaders in the region and also globally. So I'll stop there and, um, and we can move on. That's definitely uh, interesting. I, I, I really noticed how you connected the um, different points, sort of, the, sort of creating a global ecosystem instead of having multiple localized ecosystems. And that sort of brings me to my very first question. Are you seeing enough uh, sort of global collaboration on issues such as uh, the coronavirus or any other pandemic? Is there enough global collaboration going on? Because we're hearing a lot of uh, sort of independent studies coming out of uh, various different nations, but there's no sort of one force dedicated to going at this. Mm -hmm. I think the answer is no, There's, there hasn't been enough global collaboration. I do think I, I want to be very complimentary of the World Health Organization. Um, and uh, because they are, they have been a leader in some of the collaborations. They recently launched a platform where people could work together on some of the um, trials of the different therapeutics that people can use for COVID. Um, they've launched some great uh, knowledge platforms. And I think that they've done a really good job of trying to get people to cooperate. Um, where we haven't seen that as much as in some of the relief efforts. I think that there's been a very inward focused look and each country is kind of taking their own approach to exactly. how they're dealing with that. Um, I can understand the need to do that if you're a government and your first obligation is to your citizens. I, I understand some of the, the political issues involved. Um, where I do think the opportunity to collaborate across borders, however, is very much within the private sector. Um, and this is where I think the private sector can very much lead on this issue because it really has defined international cooperation and collaboration. Um, within that, the tech sector is, again, a perfect example. Um, you know, the big tech titans all have offices in Egypt, and, and, and I know that they're very well interconnected. Um, and, and so I think that even at the startup level, there's opportunities um, to, to work together. What I think that collaboration should focus on is very much on local implementation of solutions, because I okay. think that's probably the thing that's not being the most paid attention to as far as rollout of technology is that last mile delivery of technology. You know, how do you take something that's been developed in the US or Canada or Germany or Nigeria or Kenya and get that into the hands of 
Egyptian users, for example. And the same thing, how do you take something that's been developed in Egypt and adapt that for use regionally in Algeria and Libya, or take it elsewhere in, in, in the Middle East or in, in Africa, is you really have to have very close partnerships at the levels in which you need them. And that sometimes means you're, you're getting really much um, you know, in the weeds working with people who can provide yeah. those last mile delivery systems. I think tech entrepreneurs, especially at the early stage, are in the perfect position to be able to do that effectively. Wow, that's amazing. Now, sort of, this is sort of a follow-up question to a point you raised, but I'd like to sort of hear your opinion on overview on how this pandemic has affected the tech startup scene, because where there are things that are very obvious, you know, namely Netflix, Amazon, e-commerce, and online entertainment are booming, but other sort of services, uh, traditional, uh, their digital sales channels are going down. So how do you view sort of the general landscape? I think it's it's been a tough landscape for um, for startups. Um, you know, we see even here in Austin, um, which is has been considered the fastest growing economy in the U.S. Um, uh, for on many levels, not just in the tech sector, but largely because of the tech sector. You know, we're seeing a lot of start off startups are having to lay off um, people, and 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 there's been some significant economic problems. So I think it's impacted um, the tech industry negatively in in many ways at the employee or the work level. Um, I also think that it's negatively impacted the tech industry from an investment perspective. Um, we do see investors who are kind of holding on to their assets, waiting and trying to ride this out for a couple months. And so I think it's a very potentially difficult time um, for a startup to be raising funds right now with the one huge exception um, being startups that are have you know that have a very clear and direct impact on the coronavirus outbreak um, if if you have something like that i think now is very much the time to raise funds i think that um funders and um whether it be for-profit typical venture firms, but we're also seeing an interesting trend. Um, we're seeing philanthropies uh, reach out um, with interest in funding um, startups who are attacking this issue, where normally right. they would have been looking wow. at grant funding other nonprofits. Now they're interested in looking yeah. at people delivering financial, financially sustainable um, solutions. And so that's been a really exciting opportunity that we've seen. So I think the answer to your question is, um, this is a very, very difficult time. Um, but I think that there are opportunities. And I think that those opportunities, A, contribute to um, global health security, they contribute to well-being of the economy. Um, but they also significantly contribute to individual opportunities for startups. Um, that, that have a that have a relevant solution or some unique take on this, or that just happen to be involved in in the right industry at the right time. I think Definitely. I read that the founder of Zoom um, his uh, his net worth has grown four billion dollars over yeah. over the last several months. So um, so I think he was clearly in the right place at the right time. Um, kind of at a local level, though, in Egypt, I think that. Um, you know, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. I think that there are a lot of questions about geographical distribution of coronavirus. Um, however, I think it would be very wise to be prepared for this to be a bigger problem in Egypt over the next couple of months. And I think that the um, WHO has very loudly sounded the alarm about the risk of this, um, you know, spreading to areas where maybe it's not so widespread now. Um, and so I think that it's wise for companies to assume the worst in this situation um, and prepare for it. Uh, and, and if there is some kind of a good solution that you think would be relevant, a company would be relevant, then this is the time to, to turn it into an actual usable solution. If it doesn't take shape and, and, and God willing, uh, the you know, coronavirus does not come very badly to Egypt, then I think there's still an opportunity for people who have been diligent in, de in developing this technology to be able to then move on, move forward and say, this was a very bad situation. This could happen to Egypt in the future. This is an opportunity for me to launch a product that could still generate interest in preventing a future pandemic or outbreak in Egypt. So that's a very interesting point that even if startups aren't able to sort of capitalize on the opportunity presented now that they could potentially do that in the future. However, yeah. can startups um, sort of uh, be based on the sort of pandemic cycle 
like uh, we, because you have very low interest in some periods and then very rapid interest in others. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And this is one of the things we're wondering very much is if the interest is going to remain. You know, this has been like nothing that we've seen since the 1918 influenza um, pandemic. And, you know, coronavirus is the first non-influenza pandemic in, in modern times as well. So, so no one really knows how this is going to to play out this could be back again next year um, you know for all we know um, and so I'm hoping that unlike the 2009 experience um, with h1n1 um, the last pandemic uh, I'm hoping that this will that attention will remain focused on this because I think that the economic impact of this was you know far outweighed what happened in 2009 and I think it's gotten a lot of people's attention um, I personally I, I think you made a great point right there um, uh, because I think that the window for for taking advantage economically or technologically of the coronavirus outbreak will be very sh will be very short um, we've Definitely. had a lot of inbound interest in companies that want to adapt what they're doing for coronavirus um, and my answer to many of them has been unless there's a product or something unless there's a current product market fit with a product that is existing right now it's really hard to push forward with it and encourage it and support its development unless it's really ready to go right now um, if you want to use it for, for COVID. Um, that said, I think that there's a pretty good possibility um, that the world's going to pay a bit more attention to, to this in the future. Um, and I think that, that most relevantly, it's not necessarily developing the technologies that are going to uh, directly address COVID uh, that will be the most well rewarded. Um, I think that there's a, a great opportunity for medical diagnostics and therapeutics, but you can't just autom say tomorrow, I want to get into the medical, uh, yeah, I want to get into the therapeutics yeah. and pharmaceutical space. Yeah. That's very difficult. I think the long term, um, the long term interest is in preventing another outbreak and then seeing how you can look at the other things that have been brought to life and brought to public awareness around COVID, things like telemedicine is probably um, telemedicine, digital health, remote working. Um, and then we could go, we could go on and maybe this is a, a future question we could talk about in this webinar is what are some of the other areas that we're seeing the greatest interest in, in, in around that. But I think that people are going to be rewarded for thinking about how this um, how, how you could prevent a similar situation in the future or how you could create a technology that's readily usable in the event this happens again. Definitely. And being that the major focus would be on health tech startups that have, as you said, something to launch right away or something that's ready for product market fit, other established companies that sort of do not have products in line with their need or digital sales now. Uh, we're seeing a lot of companies offer free accounts, supporting their local communities, offering free perks. But what are some of the sort of still missing elements that these companies could take advantage of? Because I feel there's still a lot of room and people are sort of um, supporting their local communities, but some others are sort of ju just jumping on the bandwagon and saying, okay, we're going to give you stuff for free without really it being sincere. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, that brings me to two, to two points, maybe. I, that's one of the reasons I find the ecosystem in Egypt to be so exciting is because uh, is there really is tremendous opportunity um, to be creative and come up with new ways to address things. And I think that things can move very quickly um, in, in an ecosystem like uh, you know, Egypt. I'll give you an example. In Austin, I, I've seen a, tons of companies that have maybe mapping technologies or data distribution technology or, or wellness, digital health wellness apps that are wanting to, to pivot to coronavirus when that was never really their, their intent. It was never really built as such. I think it's great that people want to help um, and they want to focus on this issue. But I do think that you run a little bit of a risk of stepping outside your core competency. Um, and, and, and I would really caution against that. I think this is going to be a temporary situation. Um, if your core competency does not lend itself immediately to coronavirus, I would encourage a startup company to focus on more of the long-term aspects of the situation um, instead of focusing on what can I do right now in this yeah. moment around coronavirus. 
Now, that said, I think that there's an enormous um, need for philanthropic and social good thinking. So yes. to what extent companies can and have the flexibility, and, and I know that this is very much dependent upon, you know, if you're needing to, to keep your, your family surviving, it's, it's going to be very hard to, to give things away and donate things too much yeah. and if you need to keep your business surviving. But to the extent that you can actually, um, uh, to the extent that you can, you know, focus on that philanthropic presence and really actually genuinely mean it to help your community. I think that that's going to be really, really very important. But I guess the summary of what I just said is I think that startup companies should very much try to stay within their core competencies. And if an opportunity presents itself or you think very strongly that you could adapt your technology for this issue without risking the rest of the business, I think that you, that that should be well considered, but otherwise, you know, ride this out, I think is Definitely. probably a better piece of advice. Yeah, that was going to actually my next question. So startups that don't necessarily have anything that's ready for them now or are being negatively affected and they don't necessarily f um, find an opportunity in what's currently in the buying patterns and consumer behavior currently, would you advise them just to sort of minimize spending and ride it through? Or would you actually advise them to actively seek out something? Um, some companies are, as you already know, are laying people off, uh, cutting their salaries in half, sort of different um, techniques to sort of save money as much as possible. Yeah. You know, we're seeing different strategies here, here in Austin. Um, and, and I think there are, there are really good parallels, no matter where you are in, in any ecosystem. I think that um, companies that we've recently funded, um, for example, we recently closed around in an API testing company called Stoplight um, that's here in Austin. And, you know, they're doing well. This will, you know, there's every possibility this will impact their business. Uh, but at the end of the day, they have, they just received an infusion of cash. And so I think a company like that is in a good position to kind of try to minimize the changes, stick to their core business competencies yeah. and try to see if they can ride this out and hopefully things will be better in two or three months. Um, not every company is that lucky. Um, yeah, and I think the, the real danger and the real risk that we have is companies that maybe haven't you know, that are underfunded, but have good ideas, and maybe we're setting up for a new round. That's where I think the, the real, the real tragedy from, from this is going to come. And so I think that's when, when there's two ways I think you could approach this. And one is to really minimize expenses, almost go into a hibernation mode. And, and, and I can see that. Uh, the, other, the other is to see if there's any way to kind of generate new revenue. We're seeing this all the time with businesses in, in Austin because, you know, we've shut down our economy for, you know, yeah. we have a stay at home order. Um, we're not supposed to go out of the house unless we're going to get critical necessities. We can go buy food. We can go to the pharmacy. Um, but most things are closed. Um, restaurants are a great example of how things have pivoted. Um, and so there was a um, there was an interesting story in our business news uh, our business newspaper locally about one of the restaurants that was a very high end restaurant. Um, it was you know it's it's won numerous national awards. They actually switched their business model significantly um, to only doing certain types of takeout catering and market okay. and delivery. And the actual report in the business journal was that they've increased their revenues, wow. I think by two or three times, a significant increase in revenues. And so I think that's a great example of, of a business taking advantage of, of a situation to rethink their business model, figure out what is necessary in the market. Because again, in a startup, it's everything is about product market fit. Um, yeah. And, and that, is, that is the number one most important thing. And so, um, so I think that that's kind of a good example of what's happening here locally. How this translates to Egypt, I think will be very interesting because it doesn't change the fact that Egypt has an enormous market. You know, um, there are people, you know, people will still have necessities. I think that it's, that it's very important for startups to think very hard about their current, how their existing model is for product market fit and how they might be able to change it and adapt it for a changing market. Um, not just the changing market because of coronavirus, but how that market's going to change for the long term with likely more people, um, you know, if they can do that working from home with probably people staying, um, with probably people staying a little bit more separate um, and, and other things becoming a little bit more important uh, than maybe before, you know, health at the forefront of people's mind, um, I think is an important thing. That's Definitely. good. Um, 
Do you want me to tackle some of the, the questions on the, um, on the list, or do you think we're going to, uh, going to uh, talk we're, about them at the I end? I think we have. Yeah, we're going to cover all of them at the end because we're also going to take questions from Facebook. So uh, my okay, next good. question would be actually the, a point you just raised. Since health is being at the forefront, are investors looking more at the health tech sector as a result of COVID-19? Are they having more Absolutely. faith? Okay, definitely. Yeah. So, no, I think at every level, um, it, one of the most exciting things for pandemic tech um, is, uh, you know, we had a we've had a very big month, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, definitely. people are there have been very few people and very few groups that have been focused on this for even a couple of years. So so those of us who so who have been around in, in the industry are, um, you know, are, are frequently contacted to, to talk about this and, and, and think about what, you know, how this is going to is going to shape our economy and our reality. Um, I think our focus on the venture side of things and on startups in this space, especially internationally, is a bit unusual. Um, and so that's why I've been very focused on that particular issue. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that what we've seen, and that's this has been very exciting, is um, we had a, a, a an interesting article in Crunchbase News, um, and I don't know if, if Crunch people if, if Crunchbase is in Egypt, but it's a, a popular tech journal. Yeah, it's very well known. And, um, and so, so we had an article in, in Crunchbase and it had a ton of people reach out to us, uh, probably 30 companies um, wanting advice and guidance on how to adapt their technology um, to coronavirus. And this is from pharmaceutical, therapeutics, digital health, artificial intelligence and machine learning, big data wow. processing, telemedicine, literally every sector. Um, and so we've really looked at those, but the really exciting thing has been the reach out from the funding side. Um, we've had major philanthropies contact us, um, interested not just in grant funding, but also in funding early stage startups dealing with this issue. Um, we've had venture firms um, coming to us, talking and asking, you know, hey, are you seeing anything interesting that we should be investing in? Can we look at your start your portfolio of companies? We think this is a big issue. We want to put more funds into this. Um, and then the, the kind of the other uh, interesting thing is our, our talking with other people who have not ever really touched this ecosystem. Um, okay. You know, we're looking at academic partners. It's, you know, there, there's been just enormous interest. So yes, I think this is a really important moment for the health tech industry, because I think it's going to very much broaden the, the types of investments that are made. I think it's going to get people much more interested in digital health. I think digital health and telemedicine, this is going to attract enormous amounts of attention, enormous amounts of investment in, and uh, I think rightly so. Um, you know, this is, I've been in the telemedicine space for, you know, uh, 10 years now, and, and this is the most interest I've ever seen. Um, I was very excited also to see existing venture firms, you know, wanting to get uh, into the space. A couple of weeks ago, Costla Ventures um, uh, invested a couple million dollars in an early stage startup uh, focused on coronavirus. And I think that that is just fantastic. Um, so my hope is that, you know, obviously I hope that the health tech startup uh, community continues to receive um, more and more funding, because I think that that's very important, um, especially the digital health space. But I think also funding around this particular issue of global health security uh, is going to very much increase, increase. Um, and, and I think that it, that's going to be very much independent of coronavirus. I think people oh, are going okay. to understand the importance in the long term of preventing something like this from happening again. Whether that interest lasts two years, three years, 10 years, 15 years, I think will be dictated by, you know, dictated by the outcome, what happens over the next several months. But I think that this is going to be at the forefront of people's minds for a long time. Um, this is a great opportunity for Egypt. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten to know, um, you know, lots of people in, in Egypt, uh, in the technology space, in the government space, um, in the academic space. And I think that, um, you know, this is a, this will be a significant need at Egypt, um, you know, moving forward. It already is a significant need, but I think, like in many countries, it, it wasn't always at the, the top of people's mind. Yeah. Um, but I think when you have a country with as many people as closely as densely populated as Cairo, um, and you can see what's happening in New York right now. This is this is a, a an issue that is our issue here right now. It's it's our um, you know New York is essentially our ground zero, our focal point of the coronavirus outbreak right now. And I think that you can see parallels with Cairo, unfortunately, and and you realize what a what a very damaging situation uh, you know this could be. And and I hope that things continue to not be um, you know not not be too bad. Um, I'm following the news in Egypt and. And, 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 and reading some of the reports and, and some of the information on the number of cases. And so I'm hoping it, it continues to not be too bad. 
hoping for the best. So my final question is just, uh, since you're a licensed physician, you're the only one qualified to actually answer this question. Mm -hmm. Do you see a cure right around the corner or are the estimates of 18 months for a vaccine or a cure or some sort of medication to ease the symptoms uh, sort of correct? Yeah, no, I, I think that things are going very quickly. I've never okay. seen um, pharmaceutical testing go this quickly. I think the okay. WHO, again, deserves a lot of credit um, for their, um, uh, you know, for, for the platform they've launched to bring together people doing clinical trials. Um, uh, one of our advisors um, for one of our mentors who works with us on pandemic tech, for example, um, works with a company that's based in San Diego called Anson Biopharma. Um, they had a exciting, um, they have a, a treatment that they were testing already on influenza and parainfluenza. It's an antiviral. They just announced last week um, some promising early studies against COVID. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that was fantastic. So I think that there are going to be some effective, um, I think there are going to be several effective treatments that come out over the next couple of months um, once the research, which is happening more quickly than I've ever seen it happen before, uh, once this research is done. I do think that the, the vaccine timelines are hard to adjust faster. Um, I think that the estimates of a year to however, you know, a year to 18 months, whatever in that time frame, I think it's really hard, hard to advance that. But again, you see groups like Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, um, you see um, this, the incredible new initiative by the Gates Foundation, um, the Therapeutics um, Accelerator, um, you know, where they, I, I forget how much money, but it was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it was $120 million. And then um, the, Michael and um, Susan Dell, who are here in Austin um, from Dell Computer, their foundation just put, put $20 million into it. Um, I think the Zuckerberg, um, you know, uh, their, their LLC, donated their foundation. Well, yeah. donated. So that, efforts like that, I think, are going to probably bring things, um, treatments, and of course, a vaccine to us uh, much quicker than has ever happened probably before in, in history. Um, so I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic about this um, because you can see the number of different interesting compounds and, and early stage things that are being tested right now and realize how many people are working on this problem. So I, I feel very optimistic about that. Hoping for the best. Uh, of course. I'm going to start going through the questions on Zoom and then we'll take a couple from Facebook. So sure. our first question is, what are the similarities that you see between the Mexican and Egyptian ecosystems in terms of potential, given the cultural similarities and differences? Mm -hmm. This one's a, li a little tough for me because I haven't had a lot of exposure to the Mexican uh, ecosystem directly. I've, I've worked more with, um, uh, with Mexico in a scientific and a technical uh, capacity. Um, so I, I can't really give a good distinction between Mexico and, and Egypt. I think, though, um, I compare the Egyptian ecosystem to other developing um, ecosystems, you know, places where there are really significant core competencies in place. Um, I'm thinking about it as like an Argentina is probably a good example um, where Argentina and Buenos Aires has a fantastic has a fantastic similarity to what I saw in Cairo as far as, you know, emerging strong centers of innovation, early stage incubation, um, experienced business mentors, um, and then starting to have that trickle of early stage funding. And so I think that, I, I think that there are, there are correlations in Latin America. I'm just not sure if Mexico, um, how that right compares choice. to Cairo. Yeah. yeah so, and, and again, that's just me not being familiar with it. Um, I'm sure that Mexico has an incredible entrepreneurship ecosystem that probably has a lot of similarities to Cairo, yeah. um, but, but I don't know that for a fact. So our next question is regarding philanthropies entering sort of the investment space and supporting uh, startups that are focusing on COVID-19. Do you think that's here to stay, philanthropy, sort of supporting startups, or do you think that's a one-off thing given the current situation? I think that's here to stay because I've, I've seen it before the coronavirus okay. outbreak. Um, and this is a, uh, you know, really a, this is, this is a, a milestone on a trend that's already been happening. And I can give you a couple examples. Um, the push towards impact innovation funding and social impact funding, where you kind of try to, to combine your interest in having a for-profit or a financial sustainability and a return on investment with being willing to consider, you know, what are the social goods being being confronted, or the, the social challenges being confronted by the startup. That's been happening. And I think the evidence for that is the number of prominent foundations that have actually restructured themselves as okay. LLCs, which is a limited liability corporation in the US. So essentially they're restructuring themselves as 
companies saying the tax. So in the U.S., the reason com- um, foundations structure themselves as they do um, as nonprofits, and there's a whole lot of regulations behind that reporting, is so they can have a tax benefit. Now, several philanthropies are deciding, well, it's more important to us to have flexibility with who we um, support than to have a necessary tax benefit. So the um, the, the single most prominent example is um, the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, uh, Mark yeah. Zuckerberg's former foundation. Um, they received a lot of publicity um, in, in their decision to make that initiative an LLC. Um, I think one of the reasons they talked about doing that was specifically to be able to do things like invest in startups that had an impact that aligned with their goals. Um, even our funding, um, our for pandemic tech, um, we received our initial seed funding for the program from a family in Houston, um, a, a very prominent uh, philanthropy family, uh, Laura and John, John Arnold are their names. Um, and so they, for, you know, many years had, uh, you know, they're, they're you know, extremely, extremely active in the philanthropy space. They had a foundation um, and they recently restructured that foundation to be Arnold Ventures, which is again an LLC, so they can have more flexibility with what they do. So I think the answer is we were already seeing that. I think the coronavirus situation will accelerate that, especially, especially in international and global collaborations. Pandemic Tech is actually also an LLC. We're not structured as a nonprofit because we do make um, equity investments. We make smaller scale equity investments in startups, particularly in low and middle income countries. And that's been one of our models. And so that LLC model actually fit that really well. Because again, I'd much rather support an early stage startup that's solving a social ill than support, uh, than, than do grant funding for something that might not be financially sustainable and that we'll need to ask for repeat funding year in and year out. We're also asking the philanthropies that, you know, maybe the nonprofits that we work with to think about things like financial sustainability um, and, and incorporate that as part of their philanthropic model so that, you know, if, if you can put something in a grant proposal or a grant request where you're going to focus on that financial sustainability aspect, that's very attractive to us um, yeah. because we feel like that's doable now. There's enough expertise that you can pair with someone in the startup community and figure out how you can actually do that. So, Amazing. So our next question is concerning sort of the cloud kitchen industry, which is uh, going strong since COVID-19. Uh, how do you expect the consumer behavior to change post-COVID-19? Are cloud kitchens here to stay? Yeah, I wish I could ask what's going to happen in Egypt. And maybe you have some <laughs> insights for me. Um, it's, it's funny you ask this um, uh, because um, I actually, a friend of mine <laughs> is in the cloud kitchen industry. Um, it's, you okay. know, it's been booming here. Uh, you know, everyone's getting their food delivered. Things like um, the delivery services um, are, are absolutely booming. I think it's going to be here to stay. But again, in, in Austin, it already was here. Uh, and this is just magnified its importance. So I think that, I, I don't know if you're seeing it in Egypt. I would imagine yeah, this definitely. is very popular. It's, it is. It, we, had, uh, we had it in some startups. A couple of startups have been focusing on cloud kitchens. But as you said, uh, it's booming now with everything that's happening. Yeah, I, 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 love, I love the model. I think it's been um, very popular here. I think that some of the startups that have organized cloud kitchens and, and around this cloud kitchen model have been doing very well. I think nothing is going to change yeah. that. Definitely. Our final question on Zoom is, what is your investment criteria when looking at uh, geographical targets and sort of the general criteria you look at as an investor? So um, I'll answer, there, there are two different answers to this. Um, with the first for Billwood Ventures, which is the, um, you know, the, the pure venture capital uh, work that I do. Um, our investment criteria is fairly restrictive. Um, we, uh, we typically make investments in the 3 million to 5 million size. Um, we look primarily at uh, software as a service, SaaS enterprise software types of companies, but really across all industries. Um, okay. and, and, and we're, and, and especially now looking at things in the healthcare space where maybe we, you know, that wasn't always a primary focus before, but we've done investments in oil and gas, um, you know, other enterprise software. So that's kind of the, the main area. We prefer to lead rounds and there, we do have actually a very um, uh, strong geographical preference for companies that are here at either at Austin uh, or in Texas. Um, okay. That's not to say we won't look at things elsewhere. Um, and in fact, we had a, a really, um, uh, we've done a lot of work with the city of Austin's partnership with Cairo. I don't know if the, the group of participants here are aware, but we actually have a sister city relationship between Austin yeah. and Cairo. And that was the origin of the connection with with Rise Up, which has been very exciting. And we had the, the pleasure of hosting um, 
of hosting a group of uh, about 15 Egyptian entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that were here in Austin this last summer. And that was, that was incredible. We organized a dinner. It was during Ramadan. So we organized an iftar dinner um, and got to hear about all the different startups. And uh, many of them were, it was a mix of consumer startups and then kind of, I would say like higher tech things. There were some exciting things in the healthcare space. Um, there was a great AI company and another one that was focused on marketing software. Um, and so, so we did not end up investing in any of them. None of them really, I think, fit the size we were looking at. Um, okay. But what we did do is we, we've stayed in touch with a couple of the companies um, because they had interest in getting their products uh, into the U.S., and maybe exploring what it would look like to have a landing place. And so that's where I'm really excited to see that, that relationship between Austin and Cairo, because for an Egyptian entrepreneur that wants to get plugged into the US market um, and get plugged into US ecosystems, that relationship is a great pathway to do that because Austin is a, is a fantastic um, destination for that. Um, it's very easy to get plugged into the ecosystem here. It's much smaller um, and, uh, and and much more closely connected, I think, than some a place like uh, Boston or the Silicon Valley. Um, and so uh, now for pandemic tech, that's quite different. Um, pandemic tech, our investment criteria is very broad. Um, and uh, we do a mix of grant-based funding. Um, so for our fellowship program, for example, um, that's going to be depending on who is receiving the fellowship or what. Um, what company or what project is being proposed, that's a combination of grant funding or direct you know, equity funding. And we also have separate funds that we can use to make equity investments in companies um, that are solving, um, you know, solving problems in global health security. So that's much more broad. And if any of the participants um, you know, have any ideas or want to learn more about the, the fellowship, um, I don't know if there's a way that you can suggest that I share that link to the, uh, to the fellowship well, program. I think we'll definitely share it on Rise Up's page post uh, post webinar. Yeah. We'll definitely share it. Please do. Yeah, that that would be fantastic because I'd love to see. Um, you know, I, I would love to see more projects with Egypt. I think Egypt is a position to be a leader um, in, in many spaces and in global health security. I think is is really one of those uh, one of those places uh, where there's a lot of potential in Egypt. So our investment criteria is pretty broad, um, uh, and and it's it's really whatever we think will make the most impact with the funds that we have available. Great. That closes all our Zoom questions. I'm moving towards our Facebook questions or Facebook audience. So our first question says, what do you think about ed tech or tech startups that focus on increasing reading, given the current situation? Um, well, I, I think they're always valuable. I, I don't know. I agree. Qu quite frankly, I think that this is, again, a great time to be in the ed tech uh, space because everyone's doing homeschooling now. Yeah. And so if you had a solution, we're seeing some of the ed tech. We have, we have a few ed tech companies that I work with here in Austin. They're doing fantastically well right now. Yeah. because. Um, and, and so I think that this is a great opportunity to be in ed tech. But I think it's always a great opportunity to have good ed tech companies. Um, and I think that I think that nothing will change that. Perfect. This is an interesting question. Uh, with companies like Zoom, whose stock prices are sort of booming at the current moment, what happens when the pandemic ends? Do the prices go back? I wish I knew. Don't we all? If I if I knew the answer to that, <laughs> we'd invest. All of us would I'd have a lot more money, <laughs> or or hedge against or hedge against it. The one thing that's been really interesting, though, is um, you know, there's there's been a couple of stocks in the U.S. that have been really um, closely watched uh, given the circumstances. Zoom is one of them. Um, yeah. Teladoc is another one. Um, Teladoc is our uh, was the first IPO, I believe, in telemedicine. It's more, it's one of the, if not the largest, telemedicine service providers. So it's a it's a major Major, it's a closely watched uh, stock. I think it's been actually very hard to predict, though, how the stock is is behaving on any particular day. So I would caution against uh, paying too much close attention to, um, you know, to the impact of the coronavirus on the stock prices, because I don't know if there's been quite as much of a direct correlation that's as predictable as one might think. So, but that's my that's my amateur stock, uh, my amateur stockbroker's take on it. So I would place very limited uh, weight on that. <laughs> and if anyone has any better ideas or better models, let me know because I'm also interested in that very same issue. <laughs> We're all there, all waiting for, to see what happens. Our next question is regarding the companies laying off and letting go of their teams. Will the current situation endure even after COVID passes? Will companies start looking to um, sort of optimize or enhance what they're doing with their current employees and uh, look towards uh, technical solutions? Uh, he's giving examples such as Amazon and Alibaba. Um, it's sort of 
going it's the offline versus online sort of comparison between yeah. uh, online sales versus retail stores yeah i don't think it, i don't think there's going to be a dramatic change in the way that companies approach that issue um, because i think they're already doing it anyway i mean it, with none of the startups do we say you know waste money and don't worry about how you're you're using your people every hire is carefully considered everything is carefully done um, and, and so I, I don't think that's going to change. I think it might accelerate a shift in paradigm and a shift in models that people are using. The Amazon example is a great, a great example, switching towards more automated functions. But you know, quite frankly, that's an opportunity um, where people can predict how that opportunity is going to play out and look into some of the machine learning aspects of um, supply chain distribution or some of the robotics issues. Um, I think it's the same, nothing has changed. The ability of a startup or an entrepreneur to predict where the product market fit will be in two years, three years, five years, that's always been, you know, the sign of, a, of an entrepreneur that's going to be successful. Yeah. Nothing will change with that. Are there any concrete predictions we can predict for the coming sort of six months period? That's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for um, me. That's not online. I, I, but I think, um, you know, I think that we should be prepared for prepared for the worst, quite frankly. Um, and I think that this is important for every country. Um, and I think it's important for us here. Um, you know, we think that, that this is going to get worse before it gets better in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very important um, as this spreads into more, um, you know, elsewhere in the world and kind of different hotspots move and migrate. Um, I think that this is going to get much worse almost everywhere. Um, and, and if it doesn't, then everyone can be happy and have a great time. But I think companies, startups, ecosystems, anyone else um, should really be expecting that this is going to become a bigger problem. And whatever you can do to prepare for it now um, is, is a good thing to do. Um, because again, I thought we were prepared well in Austin. Yeah. I know this issue. I know this space. I was watching this unfold. And, and it's, it, it's amazing how quickly um, you know, life can change um, and, yeah. and how your day-to-day -day life can be completely disrupted, how your company, your work, and everything is, is subject to change. So the more you can expect, expect it and accept it, I think the better off that you'll be at any level. Definitely. Our final question from Hussein on Zoom is, um, do you think in a world post-COVID-19, the culture of shared economy is accelerated? Wow, that's a very, very good question. Um, you know, especially with some of the in-person, um, you know, Uber being obviously the first thing that comes to mind yeah. is, is some of the is some of the things that have actually made direct contact a, a little bit more. I think things are going to return to normal um, with that. Again, you know, whether it takes six months or a year, I think people are going to be moving towards that. I don't know how it's going to impact the shared economy, but I do think the the desire to do things virtually is going to be is going to be here, here to stay. Yeah. Now with transportation, I think that you know maybe in a perfect world, will this shift um, or accelerate the development of autonomous vehicles? Yeah, it probably will. Um, I think that that's true. But again, this was underway already. Um, yeah, and and so I think that the shift is going that way, whether coronavirus happened or not. I think it's just increasing awareness and might accelerate the development of those changes. Um, there's maybe one more thing that I might like to add um, to kind of the ecosystem that in, in Egypt and would love to have follow up from anyone after it um, is really um, one of the most important things that the coronavirus outbreak has, has taught us is the importance of information, um, the importance of the availability of quality information, of information sharing, um, and being attuned to, um, you know, really good sources and, and really good places where you can va have valid information on what's happening that's true, that's scientifically verified. Yeah. And so I would really, really encourage people to look at that space as a space that's going to be a, a significant growth uh, a place where, where growth can happen is the way that you're conveying information to people, I think is going to be changing. And I think people's desire to have validated um, information is going to be accelerated by the coronavirus crisis. So I know that that's a, a very, a very challenging topic in, in every country. Um, but I, I think it's an issue that could be, you know, really very worth very worth having um, because I think that when you can um, you know when you can get verified things one of our one of the groups that we've had a, a long time collaboration with in in the US is called ProMed um, and they were actually one of the first if not the first group outside of China to report these instances of the pneumonia that they were seeing in Wuhan in in late 2019 um, and and it's crowdsourced information um, on infectious disease outbreaks 
that actually then gets reviewed um, by trusted moderators who can then verify the source. And I've, I've long thought ProMed was, was an incredibly valuable resource. And I still think it's, uh, now this is only magnified the importance of ProMed. And there was a great Wired article on, uh, on ProMed recently that was fantastic. So we're, we're very excited to be working with them and helping support what they're doing. But I think they give a great, they give a great example of the power of, of, of well-sourced, well-verified information, information and how that can, can impact what's happening at a global level. And so, so I think that to me is the most exciting um, area of technology development moving forward. Definitely. I think the main sort of just off the top of my head, but I think the main sort of area that that would affect in Egypt right away is sort of decrease the hysteria and fear and sort of general rhetoric the, the media has been going at, even if they don't intend to, but at certain point it just causes that. So having yeah. sort of alternative source would definitely aid in that. Yeah, I'm looking for our final question from Facebook is for an early stage startup. What are the major milestones you're looking at before you decide to invest? This is going to be our closing question. I think that's a great question. I think that um, this is one of those principles that that is the same worldwide, no matter yeah. where we go, no matter yeah. any ecosystem. I think I think the single most important thing that we look at um, there, I will say two, two most important things and uh, n neither is more important than the other. The first one is product market fit. Um, always, always, always. Is there someone who wants to buy your product or use your product and are you able to deliver something that the market is demanding right now? Yeah. Or if it's not demanding right now, that when they see your product, it's, they will decide it's something they cannot live without. And so product market fit is the single most important thing we look at. As a company matures, the way we evaluate that matures as well. So of course, you know, if it's a brand new startup testing a theory or with a, a new product has been tested, we want to see things like user experience. We want to see things like customer feedback or getting in the hands of pilot customers. As things grow and the company progresses, we want to see evidence of, um, you know, actual recurring revenue um, and uh, larger and larger, um, you know, contract value um, and, and things like that. So more enterprise customers, you know, people, people who can help a, a company grow at that exponential level that, that yeah. you really want to see. Um, and so the second thing, of course, is the founding team. Um, and, and there's no substitute for, for um, expertise and experience. Um, and so that's really, you know, these are issues 1A and 1B is looking at who is the founding team and really fundamentally, is this the right team to be tackling this product? And do we feel confident that the team is going to be able to both deliver the product that can have the product market fit and then be open to the growth of the company? Um, are they yeah. people that we can work with? Are we people that, you know, they can, they can recognize maybe some deficiencies they'd have and be open to getting advice um, from other people, maybe not from us, other people. Um, so these are kind of the issues, the, the two biggest issues that we look at independent of any ecosystem, any geographic location, or realistically any industry or company. As you said, some rules are just universal across everything. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, that was, that was our closing question. We were very, very happy to have you. I myself uh, gained a lot of insight into a lot of different industries. Uh, I'm sure Mahmoud will be in contact with you to get your feedback and hopefully plan something again in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you very much. I'm hoping to be back in Egypt whenever this is all, whenever this is all over. And um, I definitely would appreciate you sharing um, some of the links that I talked about afterwards. And definitely, we will share that participants. too. Definitely. So, so uh, for everybody who's listening, we will be sharing uh, Pandemic Tech's uh, fellowship links and the link to Pandemic Tech itself on Rise Up's official Facebook page. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Bye -bye.